Yeah, I keep asking every year. I usually ask my wife at some point, you know, sort of like replacing the uh, batteries and the smoke detectors. I ask her if she wants me to shave and she says no. So hmm. I, I just keep going on waiting for a ZZ Top to call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. I think we'll get started. You guys can all hear me okay, right? All right. Wonderful. All right, guys. Well, good morning, folks. Um, welcome to our, our Friday Chalk Talk. Um, this is our final episode of 2020. The next two weeks coincide with either the holidays or New Year. So the next time we'll see each other is in January. And um, attendance in 2021 will now earn us all CME. So that's a good thing. Um, so today we're going to be trying something entirely new. Um, our guest today is Clint Moore, and he is a bioethicist with Advocate in Illinois, and he's agreed to help us with some case-based learning for medical ethics. So this is our first case, our trial run. So thank you guys all for being here. Um, our ethical topic today is physician-assisted death. We figured we'd start with something nice and light. Um, and we're defining that today with essentially a competent patient, terminally ill, requests and then self-administers a drug that's prescribed by a physician to hasten their death. And so there are a lot of terms for this, but uh, today I'm just going to be using physician-assisted death because it's one of the more neutral ones. Um, and I think this is a really relevant topic for us in palliative care. I mean, 10 of 50 states now have laws regulating physician-assisted death. And even though I don't think any of us here in the Midwest practice in one of those, it's possible, probably even probable, that we may in our lifetime. So I think our goal for today is really one thing, and that's you're not going to leave knowing the answer. There's no one single unified answer on topics like this, but I think if, if we can leave with an understanding of at least the major arguments around the topic, so that way we can wrestle with them on, on our own. So that's our game plan for today. Uh, format is going to be two parts. The first one um, I'm going to present a case and we as a palliative care team are going to discuss our thoughts on that. And then when we're done with that, we're going to look to Clint to kind of walk us through how does he approach this case? How does he think about these things as a bioethicist? Maybe help us um, to have a few take home points and then we can ask him, you know, whatever <laughs> questions we may have on the subject. So let's start with our, our first, first half. Here's, here's the case. Uh, in the future, you are practicing hospice and palliative care in a state where physician-assisted death is legal. And you are making a face-to-face -face visit with a home hospice patient who has end-stage COPD. And this is a patient you have known for a very long time, and you've developed a trusting relationship with them. And you, you know that they value their independence and control. That's always been a priority for them, even in hospice care. And your patient has increasingly become debilitated and losing that sense of control. And during your visit, your patient asks you to prescribe something that they can take to end their life. So now, being an astute palliative care specialist, right, you, you navigate the conversation well. We know how to thank people for their trust and their vulnerability, exploring why they're feeling this way, and the communication around requests. That's not the point of today's discussion. That's a separate thing. So what I want us to think about is our moral distress and our ethical concerns around this topic. So I wanted to start with two quick questions just to see where everybody's at, a bit of a pretest. So if you can open up your chat. And the first question is, are there instances where you would support practice of physician-assisted death? Yes, no, or I don't know, just to get a sense of where people are at. Mm -hmm. <sighs> okay, I mean, so we're, we're sort of a nice little smattering of, of, of yeses and I don't knows. 
Not entirely surprising. I think palliative care works very closely with the interface of, of death, so we're a bit more comfortable with that. And I think the next question I want to ask before we open it up and, and talk is, what's the first word or two that comes to your mind when you think of physician-assisted death? You can type that in there as well. Hmm. Hmm. Great words. Um, compassion, wrong, communication, relief, mercy, mixed feelings, informed decision. Wonderful. Ah. All right. So, palliative care team, what are your thoughts? Unmute. Share what you're thinking. Let's wallow through this before we ask Clint to give us some expert guidance. <laughs> uh, I'll go. I I think that's why I listed communication. It's um, it is obviously, uh, and I agree with your terminology, Marty. It, it's the most uh, neutral term, but it's still very polarized, and we immediately go to the ends of the spectrum or the poles. I think, and so. Um, I think that's the forte of palliative care is to explore more about the why in the case you presented, um, you know, more about <laughs> what led up to this patient expressing that uh, to you. So I think a lot of, there's a lot of concern about, are we missing something? Is this emotional distress that could be uh, that could be helped um, versus, I think the physical versus emotional is tough to navigate. I guess that's where I would leave that, yeah. I, I would piggyback off of that, that I, I am pro um, physician assisted suicide, but I would never advocate for physician assisted suicide without much, much scrutiny, you know, lots and lots of assessment. Um, you know, I would never take it lightly. Yeah. Do we, do we have any chaplains that are with us today? I, I'd be curious to get that perspective somebody that's part of our palliative care team, but is more of a spiritual authority. Spiritual authority, I'm not so sure, but um, you know that I, um, <clears throat> um, it's it, like um, Rose was saying is, you know, uh, are we missing something about the, phys the, the physical, the emotional and the spiritual, you know, um, what is there a practice? Is there a spiritual practice in there um, that guides them or um, influences them or that they're calling on or or rejecting or you know wanting to break that open a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I know. I wonder if this um, the hesitancy among providers is about the removal of their own locus of control over the patients and, and restoring the patient's locus of, of control in determining when, when and how they die versus the provider or physician to say, hey, your loved one is dying. Do you want us to continue with these things? I, I think that's a good point in that um, you know, I work with patients with LVADs and when you have a patient who can say, I am done, I would like this turned off. That's very different for the providers versus family saying, you know, he's, he or she is suffering, we are done and turn it off. It's a very different feeling when you are having this request from the person themselves. It feels very different. 
And I have seen that turn into a series of, is this person decisional or are they depressed? And then they go on this whole cycle of determining decisionality and whether or not the patient can ultimately determine whether or not they want to continue on with this therapy or not, or intervention or not. Absolutely, that's that's the first question out of most most people's mouths. And the other part about that that I think is very nerve wracking is just by doing all of this, just you know. Uh, psychological workup to make sure they can make decisions, are we putting them through even more stress because they have made this very difficult decision? Peg and I have worked together on cases like that. And it's, yeah. I, I agree completely with the last few minutes. Um, here in Missouri, um, we cite this case often, true case out of the Kansas City area where a homeless person had a multitude of health problems and obviously um, socioeconomic, um, actually existential issues, um, but was recommended to go on to dialysis. And um, long story short, he agreed to do that. Um, and nobody really questioned whether he had decision-making capacity until one day he said, I'm done with dialysis. And then everybody wonders, uh, all of a sudden says, well, does he have decision-making capacity? So. Uh, yes, I agree with the earlier um, comments. Yeah. All right. Any other last minute thoughts before we uh, we ask Clint to help help us out a little bit? All right, Clint. So I, I hope some of these thoughts are, are connected, but I want to respond just a little bit to a couple of things that have been said. I think the, um, I believe it was Jerry mentioned that we tend not to question patients' decisional capacity uh, to a great extent if they agree with the plan of care. Uh, but we certainly, uh, question it if they disagree. I still remember and I have, uh, I, I copied it to keep it in my files. Um, this is back in the day when we did handwritten notes and it was a, 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 a patient who had suffered a significant trauma and was gonna be paralyzed. Um, it was gonna be quadriplegic and the psychiatrist was there to assessed decisional capacity and said, if the patient agrees with aggressive support, then the patient is decisional. However, if the, if the patient does not agree, then the patient's non-decisional. So, you know, even in sort of modern day, we, we tend to really question folks when they don't agree with our plan of care, um, particularly on, on, the, on the aggressive side. Um, there is, it's interesting if you follow, which I did when Colorado passed their physician assisted suicide statute, that the uh, Colorado Department of Public Health was required to keep records of every assessment that went along. There had to be two uh, physicians who assessed the patient. There had to be a psychiatric review and then another physician, uh, hopefully their primary physician. <clears throat> who would then talk about assistance in dying. And everybody was saying, oh, this, this is going to be terrible. People are going to be killing, physicians are just going to be killing people. Um, what happened was the requests for uh, physician-assisted death decreased and the requests for good palliative care increased. So um, I, I think a couple of things, let me just look at the principles first, which is really not where I start. Uh, and I think if you ask most ethicists, they don't start with the principles. The principles, if we want to say that there are common principles, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and justice, we have to understand those really are not longstanding, uh, that, especially in the modern era. I mean, they, they really came out of the Belmont report, which 
was a report on the Tuskegee study. And so they were research uh, principles, uh, which really, and I like them better if you have an opportunity, if you haven't read the Belmont report, um, it, it's 18 pages long, go to the Health and Human Services website and read it. Um, the appendices are about 900 plus pages long. Um, I, I've read them. They will put you to sleep, but I had to read them for my dissertation. So you can avoid the, the, uh, the appendices. But, uh, you know, the, the, the original principles were respect for persons. And now we're, and, and then it folded over into respect for autonomy and then respect for autonomous choices and then respect for autonomy. So I think we, you know, and, and then beneficence was really a balance between, it was not an either or, it was not do good uh, and, and try to minimize harm. It was both and. So beneficence was really both doing the best for the patient <clears throat> while resisting, preventing, relieving them of suffering, pain, and one of the one of the articles even used evil, um, and then justice, which we do, we actually do the worst job of in the United States. Um, but that's another topic for another day. Um, so, you know, with that in hand, you know, we, we go back to the way we think today, which is autonomy, a, a, a decisional patient makes a request uh, to either say, I want this or I don't. Um, and I'm a fan of, you know, our, our informed consent form should actually be informed consent slash refusal. We should be able to document, you know, I don't want it. Okay, let's talk about that. Or I want it. Well, let, we ought to talk about that too. And we tend not to spend as much time talking about why folks want an LVAD uh, and if that's possible. Uh, but we sure spend a lot of time talking about why they don't. And uh, maybe that's because we, we don't want our patients to die, uh, although patients will die. Um, so anyway, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And, you know, the way Beecham and Childress wrote it in the principles of biomedical ethics was those are each of those four principles uh, have a weight or a power of their own. And then this is where I depart from Beecham and Childress, although they have endowed chairs and have uh, best-selling books and I don't. I mean, I have this chair, uh, but I don't have an endowed chair. And, and they say that any one of those principles can overrule any one of those other principles. So what they're driving at is maleficence if, you know, or non-maleficence, if, if you're doing more harm than good, then you ought not to do that. Uh, but they say, however, none of the other three principles should overrule autonomy. Um, I, I don't fall into that camp because I believe autonomy is, is a piece. It's not an end all to be all. Um, now, our, our case today, which is physician assisted death or physician assistance in dying. Um, I, I go back to what is, what is the goal? Okay, that's where I start with. Almost any patient or any, regardless of this is talking about a person removing an LVAD uh, or even inserting an LVAD or uh, intubating a patient or withdrawing support from a patient. And I think one of the difficult things that uh, sort of turns in our head is if you as a physician prescribe me medication to take my life, you're, you're you know, people would actually argue uh, that you're actively participating in my death. Whereas I think we've gotten to the point that if I say remove this ventilator or remove this LVAD, um, that's not active participation in my death. 
I think we're get, if we haven't got to that point, we're certainly almost there. Uh, but of course I practice when beginning of my practice, when physicians refused to remove life-sustaining treatment that had already been inserted. They're on the ventilator, I'm not taking it out because that would be participating in their death. So we're, we're making some progress. Um, so I think one of the things that I will, uh, I'll leave you with and, and uh, a, a man, uh, you know, it's nice to have smart people that you can talk to and read their work. And I was fortunate enough to get to study under Edmund Pellegrino at Georgetown. And um, so Pellegrino said, there's three questions in medicine. One, what's wrong? What's the issue? Why is this person in my office? Why are you in this hospital bed? Why am I come to, coming to visit you in hospice at your home, wherever? Once you are able to do that, uh, or think about what the diagnosis is, uh, what can be done? So pain medication, uh, medication for shortness of breath, anti-anxiety medication, get you out of the hospital, get you home, do an LVAD, whatever. Uh, and he says, that's usually where modern medicine stops. If we have a diagnosis and we know what we can do, then we, then we do it. Uh, you have a bad heart, we can put in an LVAD, let's do an LVAD. I know it's not that simple, but he's trying to make a point that we usually ask two of the three questions. The third question he says, which is the most important is what ought to be done? You know, what ought we to do? So if you just translate those into ethics and I got permission from him, I said, you know, could I just steal that, and make it an ethical statement? He said, sure, go right. So, you know, from an ethics perspective, what's the issue? Well, the issue may be you, you have a patient who's uh, requesting physician assisted death or assistance in death, what can be done? Well, you can either give it to them or you can refuse. And, and there's some stuff in the middle, we can talk about it. And then what ought to be done? Well, my perspective, and I'm, I'm gonna perhaps veer a little bit from what Marty wanted to do, but you know, is, is help me understand um, where that request comes from. What is the goal? What is it that you're trying to achieve? There's a great article and I can't remember, it's probably the end of uh, uh, last century that uh, patients who, who requested uh, medications for physician assisted death, um, the, when, they, when they got those drugs, most of them never used them Instead, they, they requested more help in pain management and anti-anxiety medications and shortness, all of that stuff. They wanted the control. They wanted to say, I'm still in control. And just because you give me, just because I asked for the medications and just because you give me the medications doesn't mean I'm gonna use the medications. Now, you know, what you as a physician do is, is really up to you. Um, Marty's right that, you know, we'll, we'll probably, I think in Illinois, I mean, there's a number of cases, a number of states that are actually actively moving this way. I don't think it'll be that long. Uh, I may be retired, but um, it, it'll be, it probably won't be that long till Illinois. There's a, a, a I think a big, uh, a large amount of support for that. And nationally, almost close to 50% of physicians by anonymous survey said that they would provide medications to their patients if they believed that this was a appropriate request. So my point is, uh, which is probably nothing new to you, um, if, if you, if you're trying to think from an ethical perspective, don't start with the principles. I mean, just, you know, you might say, well, those are ethical principles, Clint, what are you doing? Trying to get your, you know, work yourself out of a job? Exactly. Uh, because, um, 
you know, if, if you just call me to, to talk about the principles, that's not where I'm going to start. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with where is that request coming from? And, it, you know, then if you establish, hey, this is a perfectly appropriate request, I really, um, I'm having trouble keeping this patient comfortable or they're just, they're um, suffering spiritually or emotionally and nothing really seems to address that, um, then, then you make your own choices. I've, um, but let me shut up for a minute and, and I, I hope some of those thoughts were connected in some sort of stream not just a stream of consciousness, but some sort of stream that makes some sense. And, you know, I'd be happy to, to see if folks have any questions or concerns or, hey, Clint, I disagree with you on this. I'm happy when folks disagree. I actually do have a question and it's probably more um, prescient to the current pandemic. Um, there are cases where patients are intubated and essentially circling the drain but they're still full code. And going back to the principles of what, why are they here? What is the intervention? What is offered? Do, at this point, we are still ethically obligated to offer CPR, even though it would continue to cause more harm. What is, how do we approach this in this particular situation if CPR is of little to no value? Well, uh, first of all, uh, you know, write down my name, Clint Moore, <laughs> because, because I'm, I'm going to tell you something that everybody will not agree with. However, it is, it is in our, um, uh, it, it, it's in our policy in the conflict resolution uh, section of the, the uh, limitation of emergency treatment policy, which is an Illinois policy. There's going to be a system policy in the pipe. There's already a system policy in the pipeline, but it won't be till next year sometime when it comes out. So my, my response would be after we talk, uh, you know, it's not just gonna be a short phone conversation, but if you tell me that, um, that you're doing more harm to this patient than good, then non-maleficence, which is something that you should avoid, um, should outweigh the minimal benefit that you're providing the patient. So I would disagree with you or others that you're always obligated to provide CPR in cases where it's harmful or non-efficacious. So we don't, for some reason, you know, we parse out CPR and, and other things uh, you know, surgeons have been doing this for centuries. Uh, the the surgery is going to be more harmful than good. I'm not going to do the surgery. Uh, we do that with antibiotics. I mean, if I came in and you know had an infection and said, "Oh, I you know, I'd really rather not take amoxicillin. Can you give me uh, clarithromycin?" Well. No, <laughs> you know, you, you don't, that's not, autonomy doesn't reach that far. So I think, you know, patients can make requests and families can make requests. You as a physician are still responsible for making sure that you're not imposing harm on patients uh, and that the benefit, if any, I would say is at least equal to the harm. So, you know, if the benefit is maximal and the, the harm is minimal, go for it. If it's even, well, then that's, you know, that's one of those yellow light gray zones. We really have to talk about that. If, if your only benefit is prolonging biological life with no hope of recovery or no, no hope of meaningful recovery, then I, I see no obligation that you have to offer things. So don't, you know, don't offer things that aren't realistic. I still remember it was one of our 
uh, former residents who was a, his first year as an attending as a hospitalist and I was in a conference with him as a 30 plus year old guy, um, multiple MIs and, and uh, finally had a cardiac arrest and, and had a quadruple bypass. Sternum was, became infected, removed the sternum, wired his rib cage together and in talking with his wife, he said, well, uh, do you still want us to do CPR? And I was tugging on his coat and saying, you know, trying to send a thought bubble that the two pieces of anatomy you need to do appropriate CPR is a heart, which he had in a sternum, which he didn't. Um, and, and so, you know, to do chest compressions that those wires may have punctured the pericardium or who knows? So, uh, you know, you're not just a technician. You are a physician. You know, uh, people who get everything they want go to uh, uh, Ben and Jerry's, you know. I want, you know, whipped cream here and here, but not there. And I want extra nuts and a cherry. That's not medicine. Um, so you as a physician are not responsible for giving patients everything they want. You're responsible for hearing what they want and making sure that you try to balance that harm and benefit to the best of your ability. But everybody's not gonna agree with me. <laughs> well, I, I agree with both you, Clint, and I think Scott's question, I think part of that that's embedded in there is um, with the caveat that we are not technicians, and I appreciate that phrase very much. It's the legal, the regulatory things that we could get into. Uh, I think um, in that case, and, and it's not the same because it's much more time, um, a faster pace of time in the kind of situations that Scott described. But, in my years in hospice, this doesn't happen a lot, but we sometimes, because the law says we have to uh, admit hospice patients if they meet eligibility criteria and they're still a full code. And so we know, and I think that's what you're saying, is as quickly as we can and as uh, articulately and compassionately as we can, we need to educate and communicate to them, this is not only a good idea, but there is no realistic uh, good outcome with this and and yeah i think just to follow up on that I, I i think one of the worst questions in medicine is what do you want us to do right uh, because one that assumes that the patient or the family is medically sophisticated which they may or may not be and even if they are um you know i i, I still remember taking my my old toyota to a mechanic and saying the rear brakes are the, the front brakes, which were disc, uh, are, are giving me a problem. Please fix them. That's a, that's a pricey uh, job on disc brakes. I come back and, and, and the price is like a quarter of that. And I said, well, what did you do? And he said, well, I fixed the problem. It was the rear brakes. So, you know, um, I, I think a lot of times we feel there's an obligation after hearing why the patient's there, what's the issue, what can be done, we say, well, you know, tell us what you want us to do. No, 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 no. We can provide you with the options that we believe are appropriate. And if, if options are not appropriate, they should not be offered. Um, so I tell physicians, if, there's, if it's not appropriate to do CPR, if it's not appropriate to do an LVAD, don't put it on the table as an option. You can explain why you're not going to do it, but then say, well, we've got all of these things. I don't think we ought to do it. Do you want us to do it? Well, of course, <laughs> people want stuff. I mean, why am I here at the hospital to do nothing? Um, and, and I, you know, if you can teach your residents one thing, um, if you're at a teaching hospital and this is where I, I sort of miss being on rounds, uh, you know, we have something sort of gets in the culture and then it's hard to get out, sort of like getting a worm in your computer. Um, we, we talk about withdrawing care. 
Oh, we're withdrawing care on Mr. Johnson. No, we're not. We might be withdrawing, you know, the ventilator or withdrawing the LVAD or withdrawing something else, withdrawing pressors, but we're not withdrawing care. And I think that's what people fear um, is not being cared for. We're just going to keep you comfortable because that's really easy. All this other stuff was really hard, but hey, we'll just give you some pain medication and just keep you comfortable. Um, well, we will have opportunities to meet with Clint some more in the future. Clint, thank you very much for your wisdom. It was a pleasure today. My, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Have a, have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Everybody stay well. Bye.